So I'm going to start off with intros. Um, those who are on the call know me already, but I'll introduce myself. I'm Jennifer, and I am uh, the owner of Sacred Nest and founder of Postpartum Support Calgary, which is a community for new parents. We, uh, as you guys know, do meetups and events and offer community connections, um, community discounts, and a lending library to our members. And Mercedes and I, uh, I want to say we met probably well over a year or two ago now um, that we had met. And I learned of Mercedes because I was told she was a mastitis queen. So Laurel, she's a really great resource um, for the community. And she owns Vita Health. I'm sure she's going to um, touch on that and talk to you guys about what she does. But she approached me and offered uh, this free Q&A for Postpartum Support Calgary. Um, so we're gonna run actually a few series and this is gonna be the first one on pelvic health in postpartum. And we're gonna do a few more down the road as well. But this is going to be really helpful for you guys if you've had any questions that you wanna ask regarding anything to do with pelvic health, uh, that's really what Mercedes is there for. And so I'm so happy that you set this up and I just wanna say thank you so much for doing this for our community. I think it's really needed. And it's nice to have this connection where we can come on the forum and just ask whatever we want to ask. So Mercedes did touch on that before. Hi, Jessa, I see you've joined us as well. Um, this is a webinar format and um, we are going to try to make sure that we keep your privacy as much as we can because the webinar is going to be posted on the internet. So please use the chat box to ask any questions. And I do have some pre, uh, a list of pre questions that we're gonna go through as well uh, through the webinar. So hopefully that will answer anything that you needed to know too. So thanks Mercedes. Thanks Jennifer. I'm really excited to be here and to do the first of these with Postpartum Support Calgary. Um, I've attended some of your, one of your craft nights too. And it's just such a good community and a positive place for parents in Calgary. And, and I'm really thrilled to do this. So for those of you who don't know me, I'm a physiotherapist and a lactation consultant. I'm an IBCLC. And like Jennifer said, I am the owner of Vita Health and Wellness, which is a women's health clinic in Calgary. So we have physiotherapy, we have breastfeeding support, and we have mental health support as well. Um, and with all of that, we, we do, a, I think, a pretty good job of supporting the women of Calgary throughout their lifespan. So we don't just do pre and post health, pre and post um, partum. We also do, you know, from teenage, I mean, babies with the lactation through childhood, teenagers, and all the way up menopause as well and postmenopause. So I love being able to connect with people. And right now, that's really important that we, we maintain those connections and we find ways to, to find each other and to ask questions, get answers, and, and make sure that we're still taking care of ourselves. Um, so we are recording this webinar or this Q&A. Um, and it'll be made available to all of you and anybody who signed up who isn't here live. And so we'll have that ready in a couple of days. We'll send it out to you. I apologize if you've received about 15 emails from my email system. I figured out uh, this morning that it sent out all my draft emails as regular emails. So I'm very sorry about that. Awesome. So um, do you, you want to get started then? Um, we can go through the list of questions that we have to start and then open up the webinar. Sure. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay, so I'm gonna go through the first question. So um, they go, I had my baby seven weeks ago and I think I have an ab separation. Diastasis recti abdominis. How do I know what activities or movements I can do without making it worse? And will my abs ever go back together? Yeah, so this, um, this question and a few others were submitted ahead of time by some people. Um, and it's a really common question, a really common concern. I think that a lot of us know that it's possible for your abs, I mean, your abs during pregnancy, they have to move somewhere and they go out to accommodate the belly and make enough space for the growth. 
And so after you deliver your baby, whether it's vaginal delivery or C-section, it's possible that it takes time for those abs to just come back together and find their way back together. Um, I was actually watching a webinar for pelvic physiotherapists this morning, and it was talking exactly about this, and somebody put it really well. They said, imagine if, you know, for five or six months, you have your arm here, and that's its position. And then one day, all of a sudden, your arm is allowed to move. And like, it's gonna have a hard time moving normally. It's gonna take time for all of those connective tissues and those muscles to start working like they did before. And so having a bit of patience, I think is really important with diastasis, especially at seven weeks. Um, and, and I see that we've got the chat from Laurel saying, definitely have about one centimeter width, but not really deep, yes. So that's the other important part. So the width sometimes is what we focus on because that's the part that we see and we feel. And really in anybody who has not even had a baby, a centimeter, centimeter and a half, perfectly fine, perfectly normal. You wouldn't even know it unless you actually went and got screened or you heard about it and you checked on yourself. So if it's one centimeter or about a centimeter and a half, that's actually considered to be pretty normal um, or anything under that and then the depth is the important part or one of the important parts because excuse me the the part of the tissue that is actually impacted is the connective tissue between the two halves of your abdominal muscles so if you think about like those six-pack abs they run up and down on either side of a line of connective tissue in the middle is the belly button and so when those two sides of the six pack drift apart during pregnancy, then it's that connective tissue in between that has to stretch. And then afterwards has to come back together. And so the depth of it or the, the resistance to, to movement and touch is what we really wanna focus on. Um, if you have a nice thick connective tissue that you know, springs back pretty easily and, and is able to carry the tension across both sides of the muscle, then that's what we're looking for. So really it's about how does it function and less about how does it look. Mm. The opposite of that is if you can put your finger in there and maybe it's one or two fingers wide, you can put your fingers in there and it just keeps going and going and it's got lots of give to it. You can just like, boop poke all the way in and it's really soft, thin connective tissue. Soft, thin connective tissue, you don't want to put a lot of strain on. So that's where we look at, you know, how do I know what activities I can do without making it worse? Um, and it really just depends on, um, on what that connective tissue looks like and, and how it's behaving. So I would recommend starting slow and and seeing what your body does. Um, you can ask a physiotherapist or a personal trainer to have a look at your technique and see if you're overworking your abs. If you get any of that like doming or tenting in the abs where they kind of make like a triangle, um, when you contract, like if you do a little sit up, um, then, then that's a sign that you're overloading them. You need to take a step back and do a little less. Um, what's considered a significant depth Unfortunately, in the world of diastasis recti, there's not really any hard and fast rules. Um, there's a lot of controversy about how we assess it to begin with and what's normal and what's not and what's functional and what's dysfunctional. So it's hard to answer that question. Um, but my technical answer is going to be, you know, if I, if I try to put my finger in between the muscle bellies and I get like a bounce back, like a, like I would in the webbing between my thumbs, then that's good tension. If I can go woo, then that's not great tension. Um, and then to answer the last part of the question, will my abs ever go back together? They do. Yeah, so at seven weeks, it's still early, and they do eventually start to come back together. So again, no hard and fast rule, but general, my guideline is by six months, 
if it's not at that one to one and a half centimeters, if it's preventing you from doing the things that you'd like to do, it's making it so that you can't generate force with your abs and you can't stabilize and use your core properly, um, then get it checked out and, and see if there's anything you can do to, to help it out. Um, activities and movements that are going to contract those abs that are going to load that connective tissue. Anything where you're bringing your rib cage closer to your, to your hips, closer to your pelvis. So anything where you're bending forward, like sit up or getting up out of bed or getting up out of a chair. So you wanna do those differently. So getting out of bed, go onto your side and push up like you did when you were pregnant probably. Um, and then getting out of a chair, you put one foot forward, one foot back and use your leg to help you up. The other thing is um, contracting while moving your rib cage away from your pelvis. So that's like if you're holding onto something heavy and lifting it overhead and leaning back. So I think like putting away a casserole dish on the upper cupboard or like putting a suitcase in the overhead compartment, that kind of movement, or like if you have a medicine ball and you're and doing that kind of thing, um, that's also going to strain that connective tissue. A little bit of strain is going to make it stronger. A lot of strain is going to be overloading it. Mm -hmm. So probably not a good idea to do um, crunches, ab crunches in early postpartum, hey? Yeah, I think that there are other exercises that you can do that where you can start slow mm -hmm. and gradually build up to them. Like there, yeah, there's no off limits movement as long as you're able to do them with good mechanics. So yeah, at seven weeks postpartum, walking, hiking, biking, um, Zumba, like whatever, whatever makes you happy. Um, but there's no need to do crunches in order to get those abs back together. Yeah. 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 Good. Yeah, Laurel, I didn't realize that either the overhead motion, something to be mindful of. Because you always yeah. think um, about just the twisting action of your abdomen, but you don't think about the overhead and how that would affect or strain the muscles involved. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next question is, is it true that it's possible to sneeze without leaking after having a baby? I've been doing Kegels to try to strengthen my pelvic floor but I don't know if I'm doing it right. And I still leak when I cough or sneeze. Could it be that I'll just always leak now that I've had children? Ooh, this is a good one actually for me too, because you know, I'm a uh, four years postpartum and this is something that I still struggle with um, if I'm coughing or sneezing quite hard. So I would love to hear what you have to say about that. Yeah, absolutely. I think that this is something that our generation um, is actually quite well informed about because if you think back to our parents and certainly our grandparents, um, they would, you know, cough or sneeze and then you'd see them go, oh, and then mm -hmm. as well, I had kids. You know, whereas our generation is like, doesn't have to be that way. Um, you don't have to. But then there's an element of, um, you know, of women who do continue to have leakage and do continue to have difficulties with that. And, and yes, Laurel says common, but not necessarily normal. And that's exactly right. But then if you do continue to have those, those little leaks, or sometimes they're big leaks, then you feel like, well, then what? You know, I've done my Kegels, I've done all this kind of stuff, then what? And, and so I think it's, pretty individual. It's hard to answer kind of in a general way uh, without seeing this person and, and seeing how, seeing what's going on. But in general, think about the pelvic floor. And certainly before I got into this, I did not think about the pelvic floor ever. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, a lot of us have no concept of it. It's something that we just carry around with us without ever thinking about it. So what it is, is a group of muscles that line the bones of our pelvis. So if you think about a pelvis at the bottom of your spine, it's like a bowl. Mm -hmm. And these muscles line it like a bowl, front and back, 
side to side and they create a bowl shape. And when they contract, they lift. So rather than being a bowl shape, they flatten and that's how they get their lift. And what they have inside the bowl is all of your pelvic contents. So your bowels, your bladder, your uterus, vaginal canal, um, and part of your urethra, and a lot of fascia and connective tissue as well, and, and other things, you know, nerves and blood vessels. So when these contract, they support all of those organs, and they also pull in the walls of the pelvis and the spine a little bit, and they contribute to that stability a little bit. Um, and so when we're leaking, oftentimes, it's because um, with something like stress urinary incontinence, uh, it's because the stress, the mechanical stress, the physical stress on those organs exceeds the strength of the pelvic floor. And so you have that downward pressure from your abdomen where you, <laughs> you have that downward pressure where you cough, laugh, sneeze, jump, any of those things. And then it overpowers the strength of the pelvic floor. Now, pelvic floor can be weak for a few different reasons. So it can be weak because it just hasn't been used. And so then you, you, know, you do your Kegels, you do your pelvic floor contractions, make sure that you're doing them right and strengthen, strengthen, strengthen. And just like biceps, like it's going to develop at the muscle and it's going to get stronger. Um, in the majority of cases that I see, and I know that a lot of other pelvic physios are similar, oftentimes the muscles are, strength, are weak because they are tight. And so like, if I have a tight bicep or a tight hamstring and then I ask it to contract, it's only going to be able to go this far. And it's pretty easy to overpower. Like if you go like this and ask somebody to try and move your arm, they're going to be able to. But if you're here, then it's a lot harder for them. Mm -hmm. So if that muscle is tight or it's short, or it's always on, then it's going to have a hard time contracting. And then when you cough or sneeze, it's going to let go. Another component of a cough, a sneeze, a laugh, a jump, is that it happens really fast. And so you might have a pelvic floor that can contract like this and relax and contract and relax because you practice doing your Kegels and you do them nice and slow with the breath, like you said, like you've been told to or you've read to, and then you cough or sneeze and it just can't contract fast enough. So there are lots of different elements and which factors are involved would depend on that person. But really, there's a lot that can be changed. And so we can alter the way that that downward pressure impacts the pelvic floor. So we can dissipate that pressure better by changing your breathing patterns and having your belly breathe a little bit more or having your rib cage expand when you breathe so that it doesn't all go down. And we can work on the length of your pelvic floor muscles, the strength of them, and how fast they contract. And so it's, it's not necessarily the case that you're always going to leak because you've had children. There's a lot of room to be able to improve different factors. And I think that finding those factors is the tricky part. That's that's my job. And then being consistent and working on those is then your job, this person's job. And, and if those two match, if they align, then you don't leak. So um, do you recommend, are Kegels generally recommended in postpartum then as something to do for your pelvic floor? Or is that something that you assess on a case by case basis? So it's assessed on a case-by-case -case basis. Okay. okay. Because for somebody who, who has those tight, short muscles, they're overworked. Mm -hmm. They're on all the time or they just can't contract properly. And so Kegels might not be the best first exercise mm -hmm. or they might not be the best exercise at all or pelvic floor contractions. And so um, they used to recommend Kegels or pelvic floor contractions just for everybody after having babies. Mm -hmm. And now, go figure, we're learning that each woman is different right. and, and has different needs. 
And so it needs to be individually assessed. Okay. And would you say, so for somebody like me, who's four years postpartum after my second baby, is it too late to get my pelvic health assessed and worked on? <laughs> That's a really common question. Okay. I have seen women for postpartum pelvic floor uh, assessments in their 60s. Ah, and okay. we can, yeah, and they improve, and um, and it's kind of bittersweet because then they're like, "Yay, I don't leak anymore!" But oh man, I could have done this 30 years ago. <laughs> yeah. So it's literally never too late. Um, muscles are amazing that way. Good. Okay, that's really good to hear. I mean, at Postpartum Support Calgary, we always say postpartum is for life. So it's yeah. good to know you can get your pelvic health restored. Um, no matter how long you are. And I love that you referred to it as a pelvic bowl. Um, I think it just helps to bring a bit more sense of understanding to how the whole system works when we think of it as a container or as a bowl, as opposed to just a bottom floor, right? Yes. I actually have my pelvic model here. And so some of you may have seen this before, but I'll kind of walk you through it a little bit. It's Kind of 3D. And so the idea is this is the inside of the pelvis. And so it is kind of like a bowl as best as it can be for, for paper. And so this is what you would see if you were to look straight down your body and see the inside of your pelvis. Where here's the front, so your belly button would be up here. And then here's the bottom, this is the tailbone. Hmm. And so here we have the urethra, which is where the pee comes out. There's the vaginal opening and there's the anus where the poop comes out. And so you can see that these muscles really just form hammock after hammock going all the way up the sides. And they just kind of support your organs and, and yeah, they form the floor, but the floor is bowl shaped. Right, okay. Thank you for clarifying that. It's actually really nice awesome. to see it um, depicted that way in an illustration. Um, okay, I'm gonna read off the next question that we had. Don't see anything in the chat yet. Um, I had my baby four months ago and my libido is starting to come back, but I'm scared. I had a vaginal delivery with a couple of stitches. It's all healed down there, but we tried once at eight weeks and it was really painful. Should we just try again and push through the pain? Will it get better over time? I think this yeah. is a really common one in postpartum. I know it comes up a lot for us in our meetups and mother villages, so. I'm really glad to hear that because I think that we've done a really good job of letting people know that they can get help if they have that leaking or any urinary uh, difficulties, but it's kind of more in the shadows that you can have pain with intercourse after having a baby. And a lot of women are really shocked by it. They had no issues before, and this is not something that they expected mm -hmm. to be uh, one of the things that changes after, after having kids. And so, um, I'm really glad to hear that people are bringing it up because I think that it needs to come out of the shadows. It is really, really common. Mm -hmm. And um, well, that's why you went to pelvic floor physio after your first baby. Yay. Yes, exactly. And I think it's really good for people to hear that more than one person experiences it um, because it is, it is really common. And some people have no problem. They just jump right back into it. It feels different for most people, um, but not necessarily painful. Mm. And I think um, the other assumption that I kind of read into this question is like, I'm all healed. It should be good. Why, why is there pain? Is there something wrong with my stitches? Is there a possibility that I could tear again? Is kind of things that I hear quite a bit as well. So a few things to to kind of address this, this question. One is that um, when it comes to physical intimacy, um, you are in charge of your body. 
And so I'm not going to tell you whether or not to try again, push through pain. Um, as a physiotherapist, I don't want you to be in pain. So um, my preference would be to figure it out first. But at the end of the day, your body. So you get to do with it whatever you would like. Will it get better over time? It can. Yeah. So for our, some women, uh, the pain comes from, you know, kind of nervousness and, and, they, and they kind of tense up without realizing it. And then that can be sore or painful. And as they go on in their postpartum journey, then they're less nervous to, to have physical intimacy with their partner. And then that pain can dissipate. For some people, you know, you have the stitches on your perineum, but you can also have, um, you can also have tear in the vaginal canal. And so there can be some scar tissue in there. And, and that can be pretty sore if you tug on it or if you rub on it. Um, if any of you have had a scar or an incision and you try to move, like you can feel it and it, it can be sore. And pain down there is kind of alarming to our brain and to our nervous system. And so the alarm is just that much stronger. We feel it more and then we tense up and, and then it's even more. The other aspect of this uh, kind of ties into my uh, breastfeeding side of things, which is that when we are lactating, so breastfeeding, pumping, whatever it may be, producing milk, um, our hormonal balance is such that uh, our membranes down there, our vaginal uh, secretions are different. And so there's less lubrication. We, um, the tissues are a little bit less plump. They're similar to what happens in menopause. And so we can kind of draw on those experiences and know that for some time, we might need more lubricant. We might need to go slower. We might actually need more muscle relaxation and blood flow prior to penetration which translates to take more time in foreplay and other kind of touch and other kind of things before starting penetration and just go slow, use lots of lubricant. Um, if it is something like scar tissue inside, um, then it can be beneficial to talk to a pelvic physio. Uh, right now we can't actually be hands-on, um, which some people are frustrated with. Some people are actually very relieved about <laughs> um, depends on how much you want somebody to do your pelvic floor physio. Um, but there are things that you can do to release some of that scar tissue as well. Perfect. Thank you. And I do want to say too that um, part of a pelvic physio assessment is an internal exam, right? I know I get that question a lot. And I think that can sometimes drive a little bit of fear behind going to these appointments, but recognizing that there are, you know, it's quite gentle and it can be relaxed too, so. Yeah, and I think that oftentimes um, the only pelvic exam that a woman has had is a pap test, mm -hmm. where it's, you know, five, maybe 10 minutes at the most, and there's a speculum and it's cold and your feet are in the stirrup, and it's, it's a very different experience. Mm -hmm. um, whereas we don't use speculum. I have an hour, so we take our time. We know what I'm doing. We talk about everything. We go just a lot slower and yeah, much gentler. Um, and the other thing is that sometimes you don't need to do an internal exam at all, ever, or certainly not on the first day. So you can come and we can talk and we do all the external stuff. And we don't have to do an internal exam on day one. And if you don't want to do an internal exam ever, that's fine. That's so good. Thank you for clarifying that. Yeah, you're welcome. That has come up for us as well. So, yeah. um, okay, so we have a couple more questions. The next question is, uh, my sister-in-law has two children, ages eight and 10, and she was recently told that she has a prolapse. She's very active and fit. She runs 10 kilometers, lift weights, and has an active job. She's a teacher. I don't understand how she could have a weak pelvic floor, but she tells me that the prolapse really bothers her. 
She says that it feels heavy and there's always pressure down there, especially at the end of the day. She stopped running and weightlifting to see if that helps. I had my first baby four weeks ago and I don't want to get a prolapse. I was hoping to go to pelvic floor physiotherapy at six weeks to get checked out, but with COVID-19, I don't think that's an option. How do I prevent a prolapse and how do I know if I have one? Yeah, this is a really good question to see come in. Mm -hmm. um, again, because I think it speaks to so many people and to seeing all these questions come in, come in um, it shows me even more so that there are some universal experiences. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I wish in some ways that I could broadcast anonymously the conversations that I have in my room in the clinic because so many women would realize that they're not alone mm -hmm. and that we all have the same concerns, the same fears, the same questions. Um, so this one has a few different parts to it. Uh, one is what is a prolapse? So I think for anybody listening or watching this who's not sure about what a prolapse is, um, a prolapse is when one of those pelvic organs um, shifts. And so they can do that in a number of different ways. The vaginal canal is lined with muscle and, uh, and with connective tissue, and that has give to it. And so the bladder sits in front of it. And if that vaginal canal develops a bit of a weakness in the connective tissue, similar to the diastasis, then the bladder will take that space. It'll say, oh, thank you. And it'll just shift because of gravity. So it's not that the bladder pushes on the vaginal canal. It's more that the space becomes available and it shifts over. Another possibility is for the uterus and cervix to come down into the vaginal canal. And so they just go straight downward. And then another one is the rectum. So the very end of the bowel, right before it comes out, can also shift from the back. Um, and all of those feel a little bit different um, and they, they form a little bit differently. But at the end of the day, it's um, connective tissue that has, has some give to it and then the organs move according to how much space they have. So many, many women have a pelvic organ prolapse of some kind after childbirth and never know it. Um, not every pelvic organ prolapse is symptomatic, and that's a good thing. So it's not something to be worried about if you think that you have one, but you can't feel it, because if you can't feel it, then it's not impacting your bowel and bladder function. It's not impacting your sexual function. It's not causing you pain. Great. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. It's not a pathology. It's not a disease. It's not contagious. Don't worry about it if you can't feel it. Um, that being said, this person wants to prevent one from happening, or if you already have one, you know, not make, not bringing it to the point of symptomatic, I think is a really good question. Um, and so then we look at, you know, the relationship between pelvic floor strength and prolapse. Because she mentions, you know, your I think sister, yeah, sister-in-law is active and a teacher and she's on her feet she should have a strong pelvic floor like we talked about though she might have a tight and weak pelvic floor um, a lot of people do and so i think that we see somebody who has strong other muscles and we assume their pelvic floor is strong but it might not necessarily be and just like with the coughing or sneezing with that prolapse really the function of the pelvic floor is to support those organs and so if they are wanting to shift because the connective tissues that hold them up are a little bit lax, then we can use that pelvic floor to hold them up. Um, when the pelvic floor is not activating, like when we're sleeping, then everything kind of relaxes into its natural state. Um, so some of the symptoms of prolapse are like that heavy feeling or that feeling of pressure. Um, another, if it's a bladder, then a bladder prolapse, then you might have a hard time fully emptying your bladder. So you might go to the bathroom, sit on the toilet, go to the bathroom, and then get up 
and dribble because when your bladder shifts, a little bit more pee comes out. Or you go to the bathroom and five, 10 minutes later, you feel like you have to go again and a second full set of pee comes out, like it's not just a little bit. So those are some signs of a bladder prolapse. Definitely that heavy pressure feeling is a pretty common sensation. Um, for, the, for the rectum, sometimes people tell me they feel like they have a golf ball in their bum. Like they feel like there's something there. Yeah, it's, it's a strange sensation. Um, and then for some of these people tell me that they feel like they have a tampon that's stuck, like they have a tampon in there that they can feel. So those kinds of sensations. Um, and again, prolapse management often comes down to managing the amount of downward pressure that we put on those organs versus the upward support from the pelvic floor, at least from a physio perspective. And so managing that downward pressure when she's running and weightlifting and making sure that those pressures are being distributed properly, getting the pelvic floor strong and functional, so contracting when it needs to be, those are really key. So that's how you manage a prolapse. That's also how you prevent a prolapse, is making sure that you're still physically active. Right? I'm a physiotherapist first. I want you to move. I don't want you to quit running and quit weightlifting and not do the things that you enjoy. I want you to be able to do those things and have good motor patterns, movement patterns, so that they're not putting excessive pressure on certain spots in your body, whether that be your knees or your bladder. For a physiotherapist, it's the same, same kind of approach. We wanna make sure that you have those muscle balances and those good mo movement patterns. Um, in terms of not being able to go to physio after six weeks, I know a lot of the times when women are pregnant, they're told, okay, wait till your six week checkup and then go to see a pelvic physio, just get checked out. You know, see how things are, get some help. And right now, yes, physiotherapists, at least in Alberta, and I believe in all provinces in Canada, uh, have been told to close their doors for non-essential in-person visits, uh, or non-urgent and non-emergency in-person visits. And so that includes kind of a routine postpartum checkup. That being said, um, like I said, when I talked about is an internal exam necessary? No, there's so much that we can do virtually and it's not even necessarily an inferior appointment. It's just a different mode of delivery for the exact same thing that we would do in clinic. So it's not like you're getting lesser care because of the situation. Um, so still see a pelvic physio at your six feet postpartum or whenever you can um, because we're able to do pretty much exactly the same just we do it differently. So instead of using our hands, we use our eyes and our voices and we do it differently, but definitely go and get checked out, especially if this is a concern. Jennifer, you just That's muted. Great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. <laughs> yes, so important. And prolapse too, because I think it is a topic that not a lot of people want to share or talk about or are often embarrassed by. Um, so knowing that, you know, this is something that can be corrected. Yeah, and prolapse is actually the reason why I got into pelvic physiotherapy myself. Mm. Um, because I saw some people in my life have a significant prolapse uh, when they were quite a bit older mm -hmm. um, and not eligible for surgery for a number of medical reasons. And, and those people if they had done pelvic physiotherapy or if they had gotten the right advice 50 years earlier, yeah. I think they'd be in a different place and they'd have a different quality of life in their final years. And I know that a lot of people, when they think about prolapse, they think, oh, it's just going to get worse and worse and worse because of gravity. The research doesn't really support that. It is able to go up and down over time and it doesn't necessarily just keep getting worse and worse. And so there's a lot of room for for improvement and prolapse. It's not, it's not this doom and gloom kind yeah. of condition. Right. Good. Thank you. Yeah, Laurel, I know sad not to be able to go was one of her things on uh, her list for postpartum health. 
But don't forget, it's never too late. <laughs> so when Vita opens back up, you know you can stop in. Yeah, and we're doing virtual appointments too. So we're still here to support. Um, this is the last question and then I think we can open it up to the um, participants here. But uh, this question is, before pregnancy, I had extremely painful periods. My doctor put me on birth control in my early 20s and that helped. But when I stopped birth control to get pregnant, the pain came back. Pregnancy was great and my period hasn't come back yet. I talked to my doctor and she doesn't want me put on birth control while I'm breastfeeding. She said that I might have endometriosis and that pelvic physiotherapy can help. How does that work? Isn't endometriosis in the uterus? I experienced trauma in my 20s, and it's really hard for me to go to an appointment that involves that part of my body, especially with someone I don't know. I'll go if it helps with the pain, but I don't want to go just for the sake of trying. Yeah, I have to say, so this question came in via email, so it wasn't anonymous. And I just want to say thank you for trusting me enough as someone you don't know to disclose that you've experienced trauma. And I'm sorry that you've experienced trauma, but something that nobody should have to experience ever in their lives. Thank you for, for sharing that with me. Um, painful periods is something that I think, again, is so common. And we've heard all kinds of messaging around it as girls, as women, as mothers. And it's hard to discern what's normal period pain versus not normal period pain. It's like breastfeeding pain too. You'll hear some people say periods should never hurt. And you'll hear other people say, oh, it's only a concern if you have to take ibuprofen or if you have to take medication or if you have to take a day off school or work. And so different people will draw the line in different places. I think each person gets to draw their own line in terms of what is or isn't interfering with their lives or concerning to them. Um, in terms of endometriosis, it can, it can cause a significant amount of pain and it can definitely interfere with life in a, in a significant way, in a profound way. Um, and a lot of women do experience relief from endometriosis related pain or from pelvic pain when they're pregnant and then breastfeeding because they don't have periods. And then, and it's great. And then they realize it can come back. And so there's a lot of fear around that as well. And you don't know when your postpartum period is going to start. It's not like, you know, eight months, here you go. And so that unpredictability also feeds into a loss of control. And I think that's an important piece of it, that even if you don't have endometriosis, a lot of women have a hard time because you know, they're regular normally and they plan their periods and they know when they can go swimming or go on vacation and do all these things. And postpartum, you just don't know. You don't have control over that situation and that can be really difficult. Um, so endometriosis, for, for anybody who's not familiar or less familiar with the condition, endometriosis is a condition that has to be diagnosed um, through surgery. They have to actually see the tissue, um, but it can be suspected in a lot of cases. It can be the most uh, likely thing to explain a lot of people's symptoms. And what it is, is uh, uterine tissue, so tissue that is uterus. Um, that grows outside of the uterus. So, um, so uterine tissue that can grow and attach to an ovary, it can attach to the bowels, it can attach to the abdominal wall, and it always, it typically kind of finds something to hold on to rather than kind of free floating inside the pelvis. And so the experience of endometriosis is going to be different for every individual depending on the type of endometriosis that you have, the extent of it, and, what, and the location of it. Um, the other part of this is that pain itself is, um, is not necessarily felt in the tissue. So the tissues will send a signal through your nervous system, 
And then your brain puts that signal into context and identifies whether or not a response is needed. And that output of that process is what we experience as pain. So it's a little more complicated than these tissues are causing me pain, even though the tissues definitely are involved um, and they have a role to play and they send that signal. Pain is much more complex than that. And the reason why I bring that up is because that gives more opportunities for places where we can have an impact. So pain, your, your nervous system will put out an output of this is pain. Um, and sometimes it'll have a descriptor with it, like this is burning pain, this is stabbing pain, this is a deep aching pain, that kind of thing. Um, and, and then a, a level of intensity. And it'll put out that signal when that threshold is reached. And things that impact your threshold will impact your experience of pain. So what I mean is that if you have chronic pain, like for example, endometriosis, fibromyalgia, migraine headaches, that kind of thing, things that will raise that level of your nervous system's likelihood to react, like that reactivity level, are things like stress, poor sleep, diet, like movement. You know, did you go out for a walk today? Um, all those things that we talk about as self-care that sometimes tend to be trendy, they actually impact on increasing the amount of threshold within that nervous system response. And, and so that experience of trauma is really relevant because um, it will be part of that context where your nervous system and your brain are trying to decide whether or not this is painful, this is something worth reacting to, they will draw on that experience as, and say, you know, shut everything down, tighten up, and, and basically fight or flight, like get ready, right? And so you get into a protective mode, which is very understandable that you'd be in that protective mode and certainly a pelvic physiotherapist would not want to put you in a position where you have to let that guard down and feel like you are not able to protect. So that is not what we do. That's not our role. Um, we work closely with mental health professionals. Like I mentioned, at Vita, we do have a mental health professional. Her name is Amber, and she's an occupational therapist. And she and I work together a lot on pelvic pain because of the role of those things like stress and, and trauma and that kind of thing. On the physical side of things, the response to our nervous system having that pain output is that our muscles will contract. So unfortunately, our brain doesn't have a lot of levers to pull when, uh, when we're in pain. So one is to remove us from the situation, like literally if there's a house on fire, you leave the house. Um, and, and another is to tense up. And so it'll just contract muscles. And so if you have migraine headaches, you might also get a tension headache on top of it because you are tensed up. Same thing in the pelvis. So if you have endometriosis, then a common part of endometriosis is that you will tense up and your muscles will be in that chronic tense state. And that muscle tension can actually generate more signals to add to the pain. So where physiotherapy comes in, I know this is kind of a long answer, but it's a complex issue and a complex topic. Where physiotherapy comes in is that we can help with that muscle response. So we can bring down the muscle tension in the pelvic floor, and we can help with, again, your rib cage expansion when you're breathing, and we can help with that stress response. So we can't take those endometrial lesions, that uterine tissue that's growing outside the uterus, we can't take that out because we're not surgeons, but we can impact the pain and we can impact the experience and we can impact how it affects your daily life. And for a lot of people, that is really significant and much more so than whether or not they have these tissues most people care more about, is it painful? Can I go to work? Can I do the things that I want to be able to do? 
Um, so I, I know that I'm biased. Um, I don't want to come across as like, yeah, go to physio. Um, and then you go and you see that it's not helpful. But as I say, I work with a lot of people. My, my huge passion is chronic pain. And, and I've done a lot of work, coursework and specializations. And just throughout the years, chronic pain is, is exactly what really drives me. And so I work with a lot, a lot of chronic pelvic pain. And I can say with 100% confidence that if you go and see a physiotherapist, um, you know, you don't have to do an internal exam. You don't have to disclose your trauma on day one if you don't want to. Um, it's helpful information, but you never have to disclose. And then um, you can work on those muscles and, and it should help. Thank you. That's great. Um, that was it for the submitted questions. So I think we could probably open it up um, to you guys and see if there's anything specific in addition that you would like to ask uh, regarding anything to do with pelvic health. So I have a question. This is Laurel. Hi. Um, what exercises or deep breathing exercises do you recommend if someone can't get to pelvic floor um, physio right away and they do want to start building that core back up without, um, without doing more damage? Yeah, I like that you asked about breathing because oftentimes that's the first step and we skip right past it because we assume as humans we just breathe and we know how, and there's only one way to breathe. Um, anybody who's done any yoga will tell you there's more than one way to breathe. <laughs> so I find that the yoga community is a little bit easier to explain this to. Um, but one of the basics is that we can breathe through um, a number of different motor patterns. So you can have upper chest breathing, which is, and that's generally associated with stress. Like that's high tension, like, mm -hmm. right? That's, that reminds me of what I do when my daughter is challenging me, <laughs> you know, that <laughs> upper chest breathing. And a lot of people, a surprising amount of people, a lot of people, that's their normal motor pattern yeah. for breathing is their upper chest breathers for lots of different reasons. Um, and, and a lot of us just hold tension in different places and we do it unconscious or subconsciously. So that's one thing to note is what's your breathing pattern. So there's upper chest breathing. There's um, lateral costal breathing, which is the side of your rib cage. When you take a breath, if you put your hands um, on the side of your rib cage, just under your bra strap, and just take a breath, a normal breath, and you should feel your hands go out and in. Mm. And if you don't, this one takes a little practice so you can try pushing that breath down into the lungs and out the sides of your rib cage and expand out sideways and then the other one the other main one is belly breathing so a lot of us are familiar with belly breathing we teach it to our kids oftentimes and that's you put your hands on your belly and again when you breathe it's not like you should really Sorry, my hands is the camera. It's not like you should really, really push your belly out on purpose. Like you shouldn't be forcing your belly out. But when you breathe, you should feel movement back and forth in your belly. And I find that for women, especially, we have this ingrained tendency to not move our bellies. We hold them tight um, because we're always subconsciously sucking in. Mm -hmm. and not comfortable with our bellies just kind of hanging loose and that takes I have to say from a personal experience that takes a long time to um, to rewire and and erase that tendency to hold the belly tight all the time and just feel comfortable with that loose belly and a little bit of movement and then the one on the sides takes practice I find in, in figuring out that sideways movement with the breathing. So that's one thing definitely that when somebody's recently been pregnant and they had, you know, that third trimester 
fetus getting in the way of the breathing diaphragm and getting in the way of the rib cage expansion and baby's right up in there against the ribs and the belly is not really going to descend very much. I find that in the immediate postpartum, that's one good place to start is reestablishing normal breathing patterns that go beyond the upper chest. Um, in terms of exercises and movements that you can do, uh, walking is a great, great start. Nice. And so walking will tell you, walking will get your heart rate up. It'll get your breathing up. If you're outside, if you're in a place where you're allowed to go outside right now, um, you can get the sunshine and the fresh air and look around and see people and see dogs. And so there are lots of benefits to walking and you can get your cardiovascular fitness going. Um, in terms of getting that core stability, um, definitely like, I think there are better exercises than crunches. I'm a really big fan of using balance exercises for core stability. Mm -hmm. So things like, you know, single leg squats or standing on one leg while you're brushing your teeth is going to engage your core in a functional way. Um, or standing one leg and having to reach something on the floor to pick it up. Um, and quick direction changes. You know, so like I mentioned Zumba earlier, if you're changing directions, that's a functional way to use your core. Um, things like planks. I know a lot of physios are a fan of planks. I know a lot of personal trainers are fans of planks. I have yet to see somebody be able to tell me when they would realistically have to contract and hold an abdominal contraction for 60 seconds, for two minutes, whatever it may be. I just don't see the functional purpose of it. And so um, I'd rather have you do movements that are going to incorporate um, more functional stability. Does that answer your question, Laurel? Yeah, no, that was really good. Um, we do do a lot of walking and I have been doing squats because I don't like crunches and I don't like doing the plank and they're I've always thought that they kind of do spa abs instead of actual functional abs yeah exactly so it was more just what to do now because I don't feel like at six weeks postpartum I'm ready to jump back into working out there needs yeah. to be a foundation built rebuilt first Exactly. Yeah. And I've seen your profile picture on Facebook and oftentimes you are baby wearing. I do and a that, lot. <laughs> yeah. That's a core workout. It is definitely the heavier he gets and he yeah. is definitely in the carrier most of the time just because I need hands free. Yeah. So I think sometimes it's a matter of finding those activities that we can incorporate into our daily lives rather than setting aside, you know, say an hour. If you don't have an hour, oftentimes, uh, if you have three children or even if you have one child, um, you know, setting aside an hour to do exercises that are not really functional isn't going to serve you very well. But if you can do baby wearing and make a point of, you know, emptying the dishwasher while baby wearing, super functional core exercise. Okay, that's good to know. Awesome, thanks, Laurel. Any other questions, comments that you'd like to add? Hi, it's JJ. <laughs> Hi, JJ. <laughs> so I'm with three years postpartum. And um, I did see I, um, intercourse is incredibly painful for me for months after having Wally. So I did eventually see um, Dr. Mer Merle Morton, I believe her name is. And so I did see her, but only for three sessions. And then she moved uh, really far from me. <clears throat> um, but it did get me on track to feeling better. So obviously three years have gone by and now I haven't really kept up with much. Um, and I'm hopefully preparing to um, have a second baby. And so um, I guess my question is kind of similar to Laurel's and just kind of, if there's kind of recommended things that I could do you now kind of in preparation. Um, the one thing that I have kept up pretty well in doing, cause it was just so simple and accessible to me was um, every time I go pee, like 90% of the time we'll say, um, after I go pee, 
she taught me to um, activate my TA muscles. And then I do three Kegels with a good release in the three different positions. So like, like forward leaning, upright, and then back. So I have kept up with that because it was just kind of the only thing I could wrap my head around being able to do successfully on a, like a, a continual basis but I haven't done anything. Um, I barely work out with Wally because just being around him is a workout. <laughs> so I don't know if there's you know, anything you could suggest, whether maybe it's just something simple as doing squats or just, I don't know, anything that um, maybe would be good just to prepare for doing this again. Yeah, and are you looking for, in terms of pelvic strength and, and setting up for, for success with pregnancy, labor delivery, and postpartum a second time? Or are you looking to address that pain with intercourse? Oh, yes. So the pain is gone. Um, so yeah, yes. so I did uh, get that, thank God, because <laughs> that was a really horrible time in between getting therapy. Um, but yeah, it's more like I just want to, um, because I've been so busy with Wally, I haven't kind of prepared myself the way I felt like I was doing for my first pregnancy because it was the first time. So now... Um, yeah, just like any tips and ideas to kind of prepare myself to like strengthen my pelvic floor before caring again would be awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yes. Second time around. So yeah, I hear that quite a bit, second or third or fourth or whatever it may be, that like the first time you were pregnant, you didn't have kids. And so you could, you know, go to the gym, you could go to the swimming pool, you had time, you had flexibility, um, and then now you don't. And it's, it's very different being pregnant the next time around or subsequent times around. And so that's really common. Oftentimes with postpartum, we think about first-time parents, um, but I actually think that we do a disservice to subsequent-time parents because the change is just as profound, if not more so. Um, we assume that you know you know what you're doing and and you've done this before, but that's that's not helpful in terms of creating more time more time in the day, more hours in the day. Um, so I think that your question is really common. I've heard it. I've heard that concern uh, before in terms of other parents going into uh, subsequent pregnancies. What the research tells us is that your best bet is to be active throughout your pregnancy. To the best of your capabilities and even before so as well or before being pregnant as well so that's going to actually set you up for the best uh, possibility for physical health during your pregnancy um, if you're physically active and you have good fitness and good um, and good mobility uh, during your pregnancy then that actually impacts your labor and delivery as well um, partly because um, it impact, it can uh, correlate with the, the type of labor and delivery that you have, like the type of experience that you have. And also because if you're able, if you have the hip mobility and the strength to do a squat, then you might be able to squat for pushing, right? Like if you can't do a squat, then that's just not an option that's available to you. And so I think that if you're physically active, then it opens more possibilities to you during labor itself. And then we know that the postpartum recovery is that much easier and smoother as well. So it's going to really set you up for success if you can do any kind of physical activity. Um, I'm kind of an unconventional physio, as you probably see from that last answer, in that I think do what you love and do what you can. Mm -hmm. So you have a three-year-old. Um, I think three-year-olds are great motivators when Ever you want to sit down, they will not let you sit down. <laughs> and, um, and so then you can try to turn that into an opportunity. It doesn't have to be a daily thing, but you know, taking your three-year-old to the park and looking for blue rocks, you know, setting up something like that, crouching down, looking for rocks, a lot of squatting, a lot of bending, um, or maybe you reaching for things, picking him up, that kind of thing, I think, on a daily basis is great physical activity. Then if you want to push it a little bit more, um, then it depends on what your interests are. So for example, a lot of people love running. A lot of people hate running. 
So see which camp you fall in and run or don't run. For me, I am a dancer. And so my daughter and I have dance parties almost every day. And I get out of breath and I get sweaty and it's fun and it's a workout. You know, we do it for 20 minutes. Like that's, that's a workout. Um, so I know it's kind of a vague answer, but just move your body. And I think for all women, regardless of your age, so going back to the theme of women's health across the lifespan, mm -hmm. for, for all women, we should be doing something with resistance training. So it doesn't have to be heavy, heavy weightlifting. Um, heavy, heavy weightlifting is an activity that I enjoy and so I'm a little biased in, in its favor. Um, but it doesn't have to be, but you have, you should um, be doing impact activities. So things like running or jogging or hiking, um, plus upper body impact. So things like weightlifting, um, push up, that kind of thing, if you're able to tolerate them with your wrist, something that's going to strengthen your bones uh, in this age, so that later on in life, you have the strongest bones that you can. Um, and so if incorporating it on a daily basis isn't necessarily working for you, some people need that, um, that accountability of a gym or a class. Um, I do know that in Calgary, uh, to the core is offering online classes. Um, and some of the other personal trainers are as well. And I just know them specifically because they have lots of experience with pre and postpartum. Um, and so lots of people are doing online classes right now, and that gives you just something to kind of log in a couple of times a week and, and get a good solid workout where you're sweaty, working hard. Yeah, does that answer your question, JJ? Yes, that's great. And I, and I like that. I think that I get overwhelmed with like the pressure of like some kind of a regiment. So I like the idea of just you know, being able to incorporate into play. Like, I love the idea of dance parties. Meanwhile, I love to dance. And maybe just, like, forcing myself to dance for a good 20 minutes, right, is great. Exactly. So thank you so much. Yeah, you're welcome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think sometimes we forget that we just need to, you know, breathe hard and sweat. And I think also we forget that as moms, especially right now with our kids not in childcare, not in school, it's physical. Yeah. And a lot of and a lot of our kids right now are needing more, more contact. Like they need to be picked up even if they are past that age of wanting to be picked up. Um, and so we're doing, we're doing a lot more lifting. My daughter's almost 40 pounds and I feel it when I pick her up. Yeah, totally. That's how I sweat, chasing my kids around all day. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks, JJ. Um, are there any other questions you guys have for Mercedes? Will we have her on the call? Are we good? Great. It's, um, it's just after three. So just in respect of everybody's time. Thank you, Laurel. Don't have any, but this has been great. Yes. Thank you, Mercedes. It really has, honestly. Oh, I'm looking you. forward to our next ones. I think this is really helpful and it's just great to see your face and spend some time with you in the virtual realm. Yes. Yeah, thank you to everyone who, who came out live and I know this is being recorded and so thank you to everybody who's watching. I hope that even if the questions didn't necessarily pertain to you specifically, um, I hope that you learn something from them uh, that you didn't know before today. Yeah. yeah, thank you. No, it was great. I even learned lots of information. <laughs> Good. And I will be coming to see you when our lives get back to somewhat normal here and we can actually go out again, so. Yeah. Thanks so much. Okay, well, thank you, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Yes, enjoy your afternoon. Bye, everyone. Bye.